had expanded to something like this. So that if this is the visual field of the injured war veteran, the blind spot in the middle had been greatly expanded. So that when the doctor entered the room, the patient saw him with his peripheral vision and gathered the data. But then when the doctor was standing directly in front of him, his expanded blind spot was in the center. So the patient had constructed an image of the doctor, which was complete, but it was not based on recent information. It was based only on inference from watching the doctor's shoulders. And so the idea is that that's why they were dragging their foot. They were gathering data about where the world was. And that if they blindfolded them so that they learned to walk with the balance mechanisms in their ears, then they would learn to walk again. They could take off the blindfolds and they would walk normally and they would see the same way they'd seen before. So once again, this is an illustration of the fact that the brain takes information from many sources, not only from the eyes and the ears and the bones and the muscles, but also memory, and constructs a stable reality. Uh, Heinz at one time did some work with Viktor Frankl, uh, a Viennese psychologist. Uh, and he told the story of a man who had lost his wife in a concentration camp. And the man was miserable. Uh, he missed his wife so much. Uh, he, it was almost not functioning. So he goes to see the therapist. And the therapist says, imagine another woman. She looks exactly like your wife. She has the same memories of your wife. She remembers your wedding day. She remembers when you first met. She remembers your children's birth. So you can talk with her about all of your common memories. Would you want to have this woman as your partner? And the man said, no, my wife is dead. And after that, he was okay. The idea being that he had not seen that he had lost his wife, that his wife was still there, but in a sense she was not there. So Frankel concluded the story by saying, to be blind and not to know that you are blind is to be blind. But to be blind and to know that you are blind is to see. Now, one more story. Uh, an experiment was done with kittens. Oops. Where did the kittens go? Kittens should be around here somewhere. There they are. They built a little experimental apparatus, a wagon. On the wagon, there's a kind of a T-bar. And at the end of the T-bar, there's a, a bag, like a canvas bag. And so there are two of these canvas bags. And in the canvas bag, they put a kitten uh, just after it's been born. And one of the kittens has its feet up like this. So it just swings in the bag. The other kitten, there are holes, and so its feet protrude down through the bag, and it can stand on the wagon. And then they drag the kittens around, pulling them on this wagon so that one kitten is standing up and swaying around, and the other kitten is just passively sort of swinging around. And then after some period of time, days, weeks, something like that, they take the kittens out, and they put them on the floor. And what they see 
is that the kitten who was standing behaves normally. It's a normal kitten, walks around, no problem. The kitten whose feet was up can walk, but it bumps into things. And if you put it on a table, the normal kitten will look over the edge and kind of explore and so forth. But the kitten whose feet was up would just walk off the edge of the table. So in a sense, the kitten on the left can't see, or it hasn't yet learned how to see. It has no depth perception. It has not constructed a three-dimensional space. Many of you have probably noticed infants, human infants, uh, when they're very young, are often in a crib, and then the parents hang some toys in front of them, and they sort of bat at these things. And it's always, it was always a puzzle to me why they don't just reach out and grab the one that they're interested in, but they go, <laughs> you know, and they're very excited, and they just sort of swing their hands around. Well, they haven't learned eye-hand coordination. They haven't learned how to, to coordinate the eye with the vision, and that's what they're doing. They're programming their brain to figure out that coordination. Well, have I gone through them all? Okay, so these are all experiments in neurophysiology. And the conclusions that we can come to is that the brain computes a stable reality, and that the world that we know it is not perceives purely through our eyes or our balance mechanisms in our ears or through our muscles, but is a combination of those. All right, now here's the big difference between cybernetics and artificial intelligence. Uh, it's uh, an article called Objects, Tokens for Eigen's Behaviors, which Heinz von Forster wrote sometime in the late 70s, I think. And it goes like this. In artificial intelligence, uh, they deal with symbols like table. And you can translate table into tish uh, or stool or stole, whatever it is that's German, Russian, whatever the Spanish word for table is. Mesa. Mesa, yeah. A uh, computer can do that very nicely might have a little trouble with cases. Uh, but the basic translation can be performed very easily. But does the computer know what a table is? Well, you can enter certain propositions. A table is made of wood or metal. A table has four legs, usually, uh, et cetera. A human has a very different conception of a table. My notion of a table is the result of my experiences with tables. I write on tables, I eat off of tables. When a child, I used to crawl under tables. I have made a few tables. Uh, if I'm short of wood, I might burn a table. Uh, and I know what they sound like uh, and what they feel like. Are they warm or cold? Metal ones are cold, uh, wood or warm. A computer doesn't have those experiences. But for me, the term table is a token that summarizes my experiences. So meaning is the experiences of an autonomous creature moving around the world and getting food and pleasure, et cetera. And the token is just a linguistic sign attached to those experiences. If the computer doesn't have those experiences because it doesn't have autonomy and independent purpose, its interaction with the term table is going to be very, very different from mine. And this is what is meant, this was what Winograd and Flores were trying to explain in their book, uh, Understanding Computers and Cognition. That cognition and is initially the experiences that you have as an autonomous creature moving around in the world pursuing your own interests. And language is just a set of tokens and relationships among tokens, which will be very different for people in different societies. So that the word table will mean something different to Westerners 
than, say, I think Japanese who very often sit on the ground and they don't have tables as much as Westerners do? Okay. Well, that's just a slight example. But there are different associations with tables in different societies. So the meanings of the words will be different. Oh, eigen. That's a German word. It means proper. Or proper or appropriate. So uh, an object is, an, is a token for an appropriate set of behaviors. What behaviors are appropriate with respect to a table? Uh, or uh, proper or appropriate or suitable or common? Thank you. OK, so constructivist logic. This is a philosophy of constructivism. This is the alternative to realism, okay? This is the notion that ideas are primary and the world is secondary. To learn whether our knowledge is true, we would have to compare it with a reality. But our knowledge of the world is mediated by our senses. Each of us constructs a reality based on our experiences, so that it's very difficult to associate a theory with a reality. I can combine my conception of reality, uh, or I can compare my conception of reality with your conception of reality, but neither of us has direct access to reality. Now we can gather data and so forth, and science has advanced because of that capability, but the meanings associated with our theories, conceptualizations, descriptions, even of objects like tables, can be different. So one of the reasons you want to be tolerant of other people is because they have different realities. They have constructed different realities because they have different experiences. The assumption is that people do the best they can to create an accurate conception of their experiences and to summarize those experiences in the form of theories. But because we have different experiences, certainly in different societies, if not in a different physical world, we need to compare those by communicating with one another. So we need to treasure one another because they can either support or challenge our conceptions so that knowledge is negotiated. That's what science is all about. Here's my theory. I've tested it. What do you think? You know, you try to test it. So, and when you submit a paper for a publication and it's reviewed and they say, well, you, you forgot this, you forgot that, you know, say more about this. So that knowledge is constantly being negotiated and shared. You use the word negotiation there. Yeah. And not communicate. Yeah. Negotiation uh, is associated to me at least as interest yeah. and meaning. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's especially, it's very special that you use this word. Yes, uh, the reason I used uh, negotiation rather than communication is because in my mind at least, uh, communication tends to be simply a transfer of uh, a simple, a rather simple transfer of meaning. But a negotiation is a, uh, is a matter of reconciling possibly divergent interests. In other words, I have a vested interest in my descriptions because I'm familiar with them, I'm comfortable with them. Uh, I'd kind of like the rest of the world to think about things the way I think about them. But everybody else is in the same position. They would like others to think about things the way they do. So we negotiate and say, okay, why do you believe what you believe? Here's why I believe what I believe. Tell me what you think, and then let's see where they overlap. Uh, so I see the growth of knowledge, certainly in the scientific domain, as a negotiation as illustrated through the peer review process. In other words, you can't get something published until it passes peer review, and it can't pass peer review until you deal with the objections of other people. And so you're, you're always having to adjust your claims. Say, well, you can't claim that much because you didn't do so-and-so and so-and-so. Uh, so you're always negotiating your claims And furthermore, 
there's the notion that any statement by an observer is primarily a statement